I don't know why I caught myself. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I'm, I'm not the smartest person in the world. Um, I, <laughs> I asked to come on. I didn't realize we we're going to have the beer as well. So I don't know like, how inebriated you are or whether you're just all relaxed and kind of ready to go. Um, but yeah, I thought it'd be kind of pretty good to come on after beer. Um, either way, you can either heckle me or shout at me. I don't know what people are like over here. Uh, in the UK, people will probably get on a fight. <laughs> And like, you know, but it's all good. It's kind of cool. I'm here for new experiences. It's my first time in Denmark. Uh, and I made the mistake as well of um, I trying to work out flights to come across. And I had to go to India at the last minute. And I've actually changed the talk quite a bit based off my experience in India last week. Um, and I was sitting there at the BA website going, I don't know what, I think I was watching the England, English cricket or the England at cricket. And I was like, English, oh, they speak Danish in Denmark. So I was on BA looking for Daneland. And I just, did not happen at all. It was a terrible time. And I was about to bring up BA, and like, I stopped, and I said, oh, Denmark. That's, that's the one I want to do. So I also make sweeping generalizations as well. Um, the two openly Danish people that I know are both called Kenneth. Um, so I was expecting everyone to be called Kenneth over here. And um, it, 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 they're not, it turns out. It's not even a popular name. I can't believe you guys. You're rubbish. <laughs> um, but yeah, so anyway, um, yeah, I do make sweeping generalizations, so either believe some of this or not. Uh, I kind of want to stimulate debate and conversation because I think the web is changing. Uh, and I don't know whether it's changing for a good thing or for a bad thing, but I think we all need to kind of adapt uh, to that as well. So I'm going to start. This is me. I'm Paul Kinlan. I work at Google. Uh, the thing I liked about this conference as well was the fact that the, even the ice cream kind of guy who makes all the ice creams was A-B testing 50 different shades of blue for the... Flip for the uh, ice cream kind of logo as well. So kind of all works out pretty well. But I lead up the Chrome Developer Relations team. Uh, I'm based in London. Um, but I, I don't think that really matters overall. I mean, it's, I work for Chrome. I believe the mobile web is the big thing to focus on. Uh, and I know that a lot of people aren't going on the mobile web, uh, or at least building for it, at least. Um, but our sales teams, you know, people inside Google, they're going out and actively talking to developers and businesses to get people on site. And the way that they show kind of their like, uh, prospective clients how they know and they're experts in the mobile experiences is they have lots of people holding pictures of phones. And I'm not joking, the slide decks, they literally have a picture of a person holding a phone, people hanging out using phones, and then people even being illegal and driving using the phone at the same time. It's pretty bad. Um, but I kind of, I kind of, I'm making light of a kind of a high point or a kind of important point here is that Google does actually believe that the, the mobile web is the, the future um, of, of the web, at least in this case. Uh, and it might have not seemed that way kind of in the old Android, in the old Android browser at least, but when Chrome came along, we kind of started iterating really quickly on, on the mobile web space. And I think the, like I'm pointing out my blog here, but that's not the thing I'm trying to point out. It's this kind of mobile friendly tag. Um, a lot of people have probably seen that kind of recently in the terms of, I think it was in November last year, uh, we announced that the, the, uh, we'll be badging sites on mobile searches. So if you search for mobile, uh, search for a mobile phone. If the site isn't mobile friendly, it won't have a mobile friendly badge. And if it is mobile friendly, uh, then it will. And I kind of helped design some of the criteria for this uh, mobile friendliness. Um, but the important thing is, I think in March, it might have been, that we announced that actually, you know, if you're not mobile, you essentially get downranked uh, in comparison to a relatively equal kind of ranked term. So if you're searching for things and you're not like a mobile friendly site, then actually you're not kind of doing like service to the users because we know that users on a mobile friendly site do better on a mobile friendly site. They convert better, they read longer, they spend more money. Uh, and we want to make sure all, all users of the web have a good experience on mobile. So that's kind of some of the stuff that we've been doing. And I don't know whether anyone saw kind of yesterday, but we announced that uh, in the mobile friendly criteria, full screen uh, like app interstitials to kind of go and add your site or install your site from native or to, uh, to uh, like a, your native application are going to potentially get downranked as well in the future. And I think this is a big change because one of the things that we see is like, I don't want to call out names, but I think like Google does it as well. So it's not kind of, it's, it's an industry wide thing at the moment. But you know, you see like you go to LinkedIn, asks you to go and install the app. You go to Google Plus, it used to ask you to install the app. You go to the Gmail site, it asks you to install the app. And we just want people to go off and use these experiences on the web while they're on the web. And if they need to install the app, then we can kind of try and do it subtly at least. So I mean, I think these are some of the changes that we're making to the platform, at least, or inside Search. This is only from Search, by the way. Um, but we think it's all for the benefit of users, especially on kind of on, on web. Now, that's kind of the end of what I'm going to talk about some of the Google stuff. Uh, I kind of want to make a sweeping generalization. Um, so I, as I thought, everyone was called Kenneth in Denmark. Uh, I'm also going to say that in five years, I think every single user of mobile phones won't actually know that they're using a browser. 
And I think what this means is, and, uh, and I just noticed the, the reflow. It was working perfectly on my local machine. Uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, basically, what I think the web is changing in fundamental ways. I think access in the web uh, is not necessarily via the browser icon that we've all known from the kind of the desktop age, where you go and click either the big E or the Chrome, like the Chrome button, and kind of go into the experience. Um, but I also think there's tensions between different platform owners, and I'm going to try and talk about that today. Different tensions between different platform owners um, about. Uh, what is actually happening in this space. And I think it's, it's going to be interesting. It's going to be a crazy couple of years. Um, but I think we need, like I said, this, as an industry, we need to change quite dramatically for what we do. And I think you've seen that already today, where people talking about performance and service worker. Um, that's actually roughly kind of where we need to go. Um, so I, like I said, I changed this talk quite a bit since I went to India. So I went to India last week, and I was trying to like, work out how people use the web over there. Uh, how businesses are kind of reacting for it. And like, I, was, I went across, and I was going to take loads of photos. And literally, this is the only photo I took. It's of a street outside the hotel. Uh, I'm terrible with just kind of doing things where I can share stuff with my friends and family. Um, so this is all I've got. But like, the way that people use it, the internet over there, is, is fundamentally different. And actually, that was a joke in this, and I'm going to skip over it. That is the old, like, I have 30 photos of receipts. I'm going to ignore that. <laughs> uh, but you hate failed jokes. They're terrible, aren't they? Uh, <laughs> anyway, sorry. So the interesting thing about, I found about India is like this is one of the, the emerging markets, right, or emerging economies, where people who've never had access to the internet, uh, and there's about a billion people in India, there's two billion in China, uh, there's a, basically they've never had access to a computer, they've never had access to the internet before, and when they're coming online, they're coming online uh, using mobile phones, you know, desktop machines are still popular in India, um, but it's kind of like, you know, rapidly fading when you look at the traffic stats. And each, each week, uh, or each month, sorry, six million uh, new mobile users a month, in theory, kind of roughly come through on India. That's just India alone, right? You go to China, you go to anywhere, Indonesia, anywhere else. Uh, there's lots of people coming online on mobile, and that's all they experience. And I found quite a lot of things that have happened in this whole area where for a lot of the users in those places, the web means absolutely nothing to these people. Um, and it's kind of interesting because the mindset in these economies is around kind of using these mobile experiences, and they do access the internet. Uh, they do access things like I know Twitter, for instance, Facebook, and all those types of things. But the browser, not so much. Um, UC Mini is ubiquitous over there in kind of India, at least. Um, also, is Opera Mini. Um, but there's a huge number of problems in those areas where um, the developers don't even test. Like the developers of relatively big companies, they know they're going mobile. They don't even test on Opera Mini and UC Mini, and it's. It's, it's interesting because it breaks the web, and it actually reinforces an issue of the web not being important. And I think we need to change that. I don't know how to change it, and I'm open to suggestions. Um, this is the general feeling uh, that I got when I was over in India. Um, like, if you speak to any startup, like Bangalore is kind of full of startups. It's the startup capital of India at the moment. And um, one of the things that they do, what they say is, like, we've got a desktop site, or we've had a desktop site. Like, we've got a whole load of people coming through on UC Mini, or even Chrome, but we know they don't convert. They don't spend money with us. They don't kind of buy tickets for trains, um, buses, and a whole bunch of other stuff. Like, the web means nothing to us. We need to get as many people into native platforms as possible, because when they're in a native platform, they can engage with the users, right? You know, in theory, there's an installed application. You can do a whole bunch of interesting things with it. Um, and that's what, they're kind of, that's what the mentality is at the moment in that whole startup ecosystem. And it's really sad, because um, I think this is, the, this is the kind of the critical thing where the reason why they say they go native is, one, the web is slow, and it is, right? Especially when you're in kind of on 2G, it's just, it's pretty bad. Uh, actually, when you're on, the thing I found as well, when you're on 2G, uh, it's, it can be bad, but it's relatively consistent. I found that when I'm on 3G in, in India, there was either kind of relatively decent 3G, or if you're in a major urban area, there was like completely not functioning 2G, uh, 3G. And so like you had a, like less internet connectivity on 3G than you did in 2G. Uh, engagement's a big one, right? They, they want native applications because they think people do more in native applications. And when you ask them, like, what, what do people actually do? Why are you using these native applications? They're like, well, we're going to add some engagement stuff in later. We haven't got it just yet, but, you know, we want to do kind of things like notifications and, like, we want to be ac well, offline access is another one as well. Um, and, like, that's what they say is that they want notifications, but they don't actually like, implement systems with notifications in there. It's like a future path. Um, and for them, when you, for, I say, he's saying for them, but like for that market at least anyway, um, 
They, they're not even thinking about the web can do these things. And I want to show today that actually it can. Uh, but then there's things like offline access, right? We've seen, kind of talked about service worker a little bit today. I'm going to go a lot more in depth into service worker. Um, but fundamentally, offline access is probably one of the biggest things that people want. They want to be able to click on something and know that they're going to load either a shell or an actual site with content in. And, they, and the kind of the companies in India at the moment and other areas, they just don't think you can do that. And we can, but we don't tell people they can properly. And I think there's an issue, interesting issue. And then when you ask about capabilities, things like camera access, microphone access, no one really cares. Um, but they, they, people do say that the reason why they're not going mobile is because you don't have access to the underlying ca capabilities in the mobile platform. So it's, it's pretty bad. <laughs> I think it's in a pretty bad state. Um, and the thing is, like yeah, I said, like the developers and the businesses as well, the people who are actually trying to uh, employ in developers and trying to get the, like an increase in user base are actively saying that, you know, y you can't do any of these things on the web. You know, there's no point in us keeping on with the web. And I think that's a really bad thing. Um, but anyway, I've got to speed up. Um, so I kind of want to step back like 200 years. Like this was the difference engine. Uh, has anyone been to the Computer History Museum in Mountain View? One person, two people, three. Like, if you ever get to go to San Francisco, uh, I would consider, like, I'd recommend everyone go to the Computer History Museum. They have a working version of their different engine, and basically this is probably the first app when you think about it. It was used to calculate polynomial functions, logarithms, and a whole bunch of other stuff. Uh, and like, if you wanted a brand new app, you had to build like a brand new like three-ton machine. It was like crazy. Um, so Charles Babbage kind of actually predicted the fact that he would need a generalized computer machine. So he designed an analytical engine, and the analytical engine was designed to solve the problem of only having one app. You can theory program the machine. Uh, and again, he, like, Charles Babbage didn't actually build this thing, um, but the idea was that you know, one application on one machine is like super high friction, and that general computer machine is actually pretty interesting. Uh, and kind of Ada Lovelace came around trying to write programs and kind of think about how you'd actually uh, build software on this type of machine, and that's kind of where the fundamentals of programming came along. Um, but again, it never got built by like Charles Babbage's son, Henry Babbage. Like, he built it, and that's the machine he built, um, but it had like a whole load of off-by-one errors. So, like, it was like, it needed complete debugging and a rebuild before it actually get built. And so it never actually got built to function. It's kind of interesting. You jump forward another 100 years, uh, and like everything's a little bit easier, right? I mean, it's still like poor in terms of what we kind of expect today. Um, but you have these massive mainframe machines, and the way that you'd program them is either you'd give a whole bunch of punch cards to a, like a, a teller or, or like an or an operator, or you'd use these remote machines, and then you'd kind of go off and uh, you know start to kind of do your program, and then go back, and then wait two weeks to get some results because it was a massive mainframe timeshare machine. But like it opened up a whole set of computing to businesses and not necessarily users in this case, but like you know very repetitive tasks could like be automated and it changed it changed fundamentally the way that we are like it like our kind of um, you know our lives <laughs> is the easiest way of saying it. And then jump forward to kind of when I was a kid, my dad used to fix computers as a uh, for a, as a side job, and like, he used to take all these computers apart uh, like. Like fix them, and then he'd tell the person who'd brought it in to get repaired, oh, it's going to cost you 50 pounds to get this fixed. And they were like, 50 pounds, that's too expensive. You can keep the machine, it's fine. And my dad had already fixed it by this time. He wasn't the best businessman in the world. Um, but like, he, so by the time like, he'd fix these things, and like, he'd, like, we came up, and I, I still go around to the house, they got 20, 30 different machines from like Commodore 64 to Amiga 500s. But this is the machine I had, and like, you'd put a cassette in, load a game, type run or whatever it was, I can't remember now, load a game, and then five minutes later you're playing a game or you're using a spreadsheet kind of app. Like, again, a massive leap from the punch cards, like it opened up a whole bunch of new home computing for us. And it was really cool, right? And then you jump through and, like, another couple, like a year or so, like, I was told that this was just as slow as cassettes, but I remember this being really, really quick. I could load California games up in about 10 seconds, and I was just playing games like crazy when I was a kid. Um, so it was great, and like, my dad hated it because I wasn't doing any schoolwork, and my mum, she didn't really bother. But anyway, um, so that was kind of interesting. Like, games in five seconds or 10 seconds reduce friction again, right? You can start to use these experiences, and computing becomes even more powerful. And then you get three and a half inch floppies. Does anyone, did anyone install Windows 95 on three and a half inch floppies? Yeah, a good couple of people are right. It took hours, right? It was it was terrible. And then like the, the like the twenty second disc would, would error and you'd be like, Oh, I can't do the damn thing. So anyway, but the three and a half inch floppy has allowed us to transport like at least a megabyte or one point four meg of data between computers, install things again, friction was reduced and it was easier to actually go and either run applications or transport data. Pretty powerful. Then you jump through kind of again, right, DVDs and CDs, those types of things, massive amounts of data. To install Windows on this, it was about an hour. Uh, at the time, from what I remember, on Windows 95. Um, 
But that was actually really powerful, right? It brought a step change again in kind of what we could do on our computers. Big applications, encyclopedias, all these types of things. Uh, with relatively little friction, you just put a little disk into a machine, and then you get access to all this information. Um, but the problem was, actually, it was really hard to, like, like, I didn't mind these. My parents hated them. My grandfather, my grandmother, like, I'd have to go around to their houses all the time and fix their machines because the installation process was hard. It was horrible. It didn't always work. It was just pretty slow. And if you're in an enterprise, like, it was just terrible, right? You'd have to try and deploy one application across 50,000 different machines. It was really, really hard. Uh, and then kind of comes along the web, and you have, I'm going to use Gmail as an example and Google, but like, those type of applications were the first time you sit there and go, like, this is a replacement for native applications for me on desktop. It's really powerful, right? And the reason was not necessarily because the applications are more capable, right? They weren't necessarily more capable. They didn't have access to underlying hardware. Uh, like things like a USB at the time, you couldn't do any of those types of things. But the delivery model, the way that you could get access to these things was so much better, right? There was zero friction nearly. You type a URL in, you're straight into the experience, right? And that was brilliant, right? Um, and the, the, the point is I'm trying to make is that fundamentally friction was removed across the entirety, like every single, like every single step along the way, some form of friction was, friction was removed, and we started to use computers more and more and more and more. And the way that I've been trying to think about this, and the way that the, the, the Chrome team are thinking about the properties of the web, why the web is good, and it was talked about a little bit earlier, um, they, about a year and a half ago or two years ago, they, they coined a term called slice, and we never actually announced it um, because well, it, it made a lot of sense, but we didn't know whether actually we, were, we needed to talk about it that much. Um, but Slice was a really interesting way of actually encapsulating the good properties of the web. Uh, the first is secure. You know, everything is sandboxed and isolated. One site can't interfere with another site, uh, in theory. Um, so that's a really powerful benefit of the web. On native applications in the past, on desktop, for instance, you know, that was actually a big problem of just kind of completely overwriting, uh, uh, overwriting configuration. You know, everyone said this today, linkable. You know, you can link to something, and then you can either load an application, experience, or get some access to content, and all you do is navigate to it. Again, very, very powerful. Indexable, the fact that we can actually take the link, crawl it, and then understand what's behind it, actually is really powerful, right? Because then you get services like Bing, Google, and all those types of things. Uh, that's, that's pretty cool. Uh, composable, uh, this one's actually a little bit harder, but like, you know, the, the whole mashup community from like 2000, uh, the early 2000s, you know, you take iframes and JavaScript, push them together, and all of a sudden, with very little kind of work, you get entirely in like entire new applications. And then there's a thing called E, which is ephemeral, and I, I can't find an image to describe what ephemeral means, but the easiest way of saying it is um, you go into, you open up Gmail, for instance, you go into Gmail, you do something, you close the tab, and like no state is like no state remains on the actual machine itself, and that's a really powerful thing. You can go off, use 20, 30 different applications in a day, and completely understand that your machine is going to be in a relatively clean state when you, once you're actually finished using that. With applications, native applications on desktop platforms, that wasn't the case, right? You'd install something, and it would live and maintain on your system. It might install drivers and a whole bunch of other stuff. It was crazy. But it was a nice way of thinking about it. And now, like, there's like five different properties which like, describe the web as a kind of like a simple way of describing the good properties of the web. There's actually a couple more. Um, one was deployable, um, so you could say sliced. Uh, you know, it's easy to deploy and maintain. Um, but sometimes people say uh, updatable as well, so you can just kind of update one place and then they get kind of replicated everywhere. The problem is, is like SLUSH or SLUSE is just the worst acronym ever. It's basically a, a funnel of water. Uh, means absolutely nothing. <laughs> um, but the thing is, for me at least anyway, is that I, I have to question whether that, those kind of properties are important for mobile. Uh, especially with the introduction of the iPhone. So I look at this, and I, I kind of categorized everything as pre-internet, post-internet, um, sorry, pre-internet and current internet, sorry, and before mobile and after mobile. Now, you look at kind of the like, delivery methods of data, DVDs, for instance, massive amounts of data. We still use DVDs for games because it's just an easy way to transport a lot of data. Um, but fundamentally, the mobile platform is changing for things that people do, right? They use chat applications. They still use the web. Um, so they use chat. They use uh, app stores as well as a delivery platform for applications. And those applications, those app stores, have, have got a lot of the properties of the slice principle. So they're secure, sandboxed, and, and all those types of things as well. So I think fundamentally, we're in a point of where there's a, a threat to the web uh, coming from native applications. And it's not necessarily about capabilities. Um, so yeah, like the app stores, like, I, I look at this, and I'm trying to define this point here, but like 2009 uh, or 2007 was when the iPhone, I think, was introduced. There were 1.3 billion users of the internet. Uh, there's 2 billion, of users of, two, 2 billion extra users, so 3 billion users in total of the internet already. And the majority of these people are coming online uh, right now with mobile, and they don't know anything 
prior to kind of what we know today of native applications as the way that you go about communicating with people and actually doing work on a device. Uh, and we've all seen these stats. I think this was kind of pushed up earlier on today. Like 86% of the user time is spent in, in like inside native applications, right? And only 14% is on the web. It's actually gone down to 12% in the latest Flurry stats. Uh, so it's looking kind of pretty bad. Um, but the thing is, and like if you if you're running like a business, like say a newspaper, for instance, um, you you know that's probably not quite the case. Like people do spend time in applications, but a lot of time people spend in applications they spend on the web. Um, but it's completely unaccountable, right? We have no idea about how much data or how many users or how long people spend inside the web on mobile devices, uh, and that's going to change. Um, like, and I'm going to talk like web views, for instance, are going to start having referrers and a whole bunch of other stuff. So like we're going to start to understand. Uh, how long people do really spend on the web on mobile devices, and I do think it's going to increase quite dramatically. But still, fundamentally, people spend a lot of time in at least four different applications, and those applications uh, I kind of want to talk about now. So there's, de there's definitely many different entry points into the mobile platform, um, and they're all kind of, they, they divest the web to some extent, and I'm going to talk about them. Uh, email is a really big one. Uh, you, you get email on your iPhone or your Android device. They normally contain links. You click the link, go in the browser. That's cool. The web is still kind of fundamentally there, right? Uh, where it gets interesting is messengers and social applications. Again, you share links between your friends, your family, your subscribed to news feeds. Uh, these applications drive quite a lot of traffic now, especially in emerging markets. Uh, however, they, they're not actually pushing you out to a browser. They're either trying to control the experience themselves, and I'm going to talk about the platforms. Uh, notifications. Notifications drive a huge amount of traffic. That's the thing. It's like we, I'll talk about it a little bit later. Um, but the reason why people use notifications in native applications is because they know that you can re-engage users. Uh, and it is coming to the web, and it does drive a lot of traffic. So it's kind of good. Um, but notifications fundamentally drive you back into the native application. Web views, beacons, and search, they're all interesting. Like search on your mobile device looks like an application now. It doesn't look like a website that you go to. And then when you click on the link, it doesn't necessarily always open up the browser. Um, and also, and I'm going to talk about deep links in a minute, but deep app linking is a really big thing on mobile. Um, native applications will be able to control entire domains. So Twitter.com will be able to open only in the Twitter.com app, uh, not on the website. Uh, and that's interesting because from search, from all these new entry points, you, like, the web is completely bypassed. So is the web under threat, right? <laughs> well, I think I, we need to dive into briefly into this, right? And I'm, it's going to get a lot happier towards the end of this talk, right? I promise you, right? Everyone's jobs are still secure. <laughs> but it is a kind of a bit of a downer, right? So is the web under threat? The traditional way that we look at the web is it's a platform on top, built on top of other platforms. It's on every single desktop. It has to be on every single mobile device. And the primary mobile devices uh, at the moment are iOS and Android. So. Sorry about Windows. Um, but like, at the moment, I just didn't have enough space to put Windows on that as well. But like, <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, but yeah, iOS and Android are the dominant mobile platforms. And they all have very good mobile browsers, right? Safari, great browser. Uh, doesn't implement the same things that Chrome does, causes issues. Um, and that's the traditional way that we as web developers think, like our platform, right? We know that we've got 1 billion, 2 billion users we can target with the web. That's pretty powerful. Um, but when you look at the emerging economy, it actually gets a little bit more different. Messenger applications are a really, really big thing. So Facebook, for instance, is a really, like, it's a billion users. They had a billion users on their entire, like, their sites and apps uh, for one day the other week. Uh, it's pretty crazy. Um, Line, as well, is pretty big. Kakao, uh, WeChat is massive. Like, you go to China, WeChat is absolutely huge. Uh, and the interesting thing is that I can't remember what I was going to say now. Um, yeah, so anyways, yeah. The, the place that these are going right now is that if you look at all these underlying platforms, where we know that the web excels is content, right? You know, news sites, articles, blogs, everything we can produce, we kind of put on the web, and it's addressable and openable inside a browser. And you look at different platforms like Android, uh, not Android, sorry, like iOS, for instance. And iOS is doing kind of Apple News soon. Like, the, the way that they want you to consume news experiences, not via the web, it's via the kind of the news experiences. And if you look at Facebook as well, like Facebook are doing the same thing, right? So Facebook have got instant articles. It's a relatively small trial to start off with. But the, like the things that they're talking about are really resonate with a lot of users and a lot of businesses. And I'm going to go into that in a minute. And then if you look at, say, WeChat, for instance, you know, business pages, you can subscribe to a whole bunch of other stuff. You can create content on these platforms and produce them, and you never actually ever have to go to the web. And you know that at least a billion, 1.5 billion users are going to be able to access and see that content. And I think that's one of those things that are actually pretty interesting. But the thing that they push is performance, right? There's two things, actually. Performance and offline, instant access to content, regardless of your connection state. And on the web today, we have technologies to change this. But as developers, we, we don't actually build systems and 
uh, systems that are necessarily performant or even work offline. I do actually want to ask one quick question. So has anyone made their website work offline? Two, three, four, like four out of uh, how many people are here? 300, four people out of 300. I think, um, I think that's, that's endemic of part of the problem, right? Like we, we as web developers don't necessarily believe that we should be making offline experiences. And I need to tell you right now, we, we need to be thinking about mobile. We need to be thinking about offline and we need to be thinking about performance. So anyway, yeah, the web in this, in this area is like, it's, it's kind of everyone is bashing the web. And a lot of it is, you know, ads, those types of things are causing some issues. Plugins, third-party plugins, the, like the composable nature of the web in Slice is actually potentially causing some of the issues. Like we saw it from Patrick's talk earlier on. Uh, like if you, the more third-party plugins that you, like you use, the slower your site gets because you have to resolve all the content and the connections and all that type of stuff. So like there's a lot of stuff that we need to do as developers to change this, but there's also a lot of stuff that browser vendors need to do. And then if you look back at the platforms again, uh, as app platforms, again, like every single one of these platforms is starting to integrate app-like functionality into them. So where we've had apps and we're thinking like, you know, we can deploy Gmail, that's fine. Uh, but like other kind of different applications that we want, they're all starting to come through every single one of these platforms. Every single one of these providers has an API that is accessible directly in a mobile application. And I think uh, like that is kind of interesting because one of the things that they do is that they push capabilities that we don't have on the web. Payments is a really big one, right? So they're sitting there going, actually, we can, we can solve payments you know, just on mobile really easily, and we can deploy to any platform, iOS or Android or desktop, or maybe not desktop, but iOS and Android, and solve the payments issue at the same time with our platform. And I think that is really powerful and really compelling, and we need to actually sort that out. And again, because the web, don't have a payments API, we have a lot of third-party plugins and all those types of things, uh, it's really hard. And I noticed this in India, it's like no one does payments on the web. People do payments in native applications because they can intercept the web requests coming through. Um, but like they have to reformat the pages and everything because mobile is in such a bad state, or mobile web is in such a bad state over there. Um, so the web is in a really weird place. Now the interesting thing is about each of those apps is they want to be the next browser, right? They want to sit there and go, we want to control the entire web experience for users. We don't want to have to push people out. And like as web developers, they, this is what we want, right? You want to kind of open, you click on a link, you open up the browser, and you go straight in. And it's good because it's simple, it's secure, uh, it's, it's pretty bad for app developers at least because they potentially lose you out of the experience, they want to keep you in there, and it's not branded. You don't know it's like the Facebook app or the Twitter app and those types of things. So one thing that they do is they, they do the web view, and we've all seen the web view, and that's where we lose accountability of all the traffic. Um, but generally, they, they want to keep users inside the app, inside the brand. Like this is the Twitter experience for a website, and in India, they actually transform the site to make it work more quickly, download really quickly, and make it readable. And it's actually really, really good. The, the sites load really quickly, and they scroll really well as well. But they want to keep you in brand. Uh, but the problems are, like things like if it's in a web view, every single URL that you go to can be tracked by those apps. Uh, that's one thing. And often they don't implement all the features. So like if you want to use the camera, or you want to use the microphone, those types of things, like they have to implement that functionality back into the web view. It's a pain to go and integrate these things. So up comes kind of the embeddable browser. We announced this yesterday. This is the Chrome custom tabs. Uh, the idea is that you can take Chrome and then style up Chrome to kind of match your app and kind of the animations and the buttons and all those types of things. It looks like your native application in your experience, but it's actually the Chrome browser. And now the thought behind this is that if you log into Facebook on the web, uh, on the mobile, then you get a shared cookie store across all the, all the types of different applications that you might use so that you can log straight, into, uh, log straight into Facebook. And that's actually really powerful for users and developers, and it's a really powerful feature. Safari, you're doing the same thing in iOS. Uh, and we're going to see more and more of these things as well. And that's, like, you're not going to, like, I'm not going to say you're not going to see traffic from a browser, you are. But, like, this is potentially the new style of browser that you're going to see, Facebook, Twitter, all these types of applications. They want to keep you inside their branded experience. And you're going to see traffic referrals come from all those platforms. And just to highlight some of the, the kind of the interesting things, I don't know whether this is, is this autoplaying? No, it's not autoplaying. Uh, I don't know why it's not autoplaying. But the thing is around this is that, I'm actually really worried for all my other demos now, um, is that the, the, with the embeddable, like the web views, you can say pre-fetch and pre-connect to all these services. So like if you're going to go to the news.bbc.co.uk, you can tell the browser, I know the user is going to go to this site, pre-connect to it warm, it, warm the browser up, and you can reduce the startup time by two or three seconds quite easily uh, in comparison to a web view. And that's actually pretty good for users, it's pretty good for the web, and it's pretty good for native applications as well. Um, but then each platform also tries to intend to be the next web as well. 
And I think, like, I don't, like, there's, there's a Trojan horse, right? And I, I don't want to say, like, I, I like React. I think Facebook are in a very interesting position by using React and pushing kind of React Native and a whole bunch of other platforms because now on iOS and Android, you can run and download JavaScript however you want. It doesn't have to be delivered with the installed application, um, which is actually really good because you can now create kind of native applications which render native widgets and components using HTML-like syntax uh, with the React templates, also kind of a CSS-like syntax with their kind of uh, modules that they've imported now, uh, and then also JavaScript as well. So like, it's kind of interesting. You can build one application in theory that runs across all of Facebook's platform. And I can see other browser, vend not other browser vendors, but other messaging platforms actually doing the same type of thing because it's a very powerful thing to do to be able to have that kind of application runtime to another one and a half billion users, active users who use these types of things. So it's interesting, right? I mean, it, it seems pretty bleak for the web, um, but I think there are a lot of things that we can do. Um, I, I've kind of tried to categorize it as three, three main areas. Uh, of things that we, we as web developers, uh, we can take advantage of what the browser vendors, like Chrome, for instance, and Firefox, and, and um, Internet Explorer are doing. And we can, we can take advantage of these today, or in, in some cases today, at least, anyway. And we can actually build better experiences that kind of delight users, right? And I think that I've, I've kind of done it in reverse order. I think one of the biggest ones is, is to act installed, right, but be ephemeral. Like, the power of the web is to kind of click on a link, you go to the site, it's not actually installed. Like you don't have to go and do the download, but you're using the experience straight away. You go into the web page, you open it up, you write your email, and you can get out pretty quickly. But the thing is, like native applications, they push forward this idea of being installed all the time and having the deeper integration. And I think we can do that on the web, right? I actually think we can do that, and it's through service work and a bunch of other technologies that give us the capabilities and the power to be able to build those type of experiences with that single superpower of not having to do the install itself. Now, there's, there's two areas. So I tried to classify uh, kind of what um, the market's looking like at the moment. So we've had deep app linking and single click, no install, basically. The web has had that for years and years and years. Um, native applications now have got deep app linking built in, or native, app, native platforms, iOS 9, Android M, are going to have full on deep app linking built right in. And then, so the interesting thing there is like, that actually removes the power of the web, right? Because Native applications can just say, I own Twitter.com, I own Gmail, or I own all these things. You'll never, ever go back to the website. So that's actually a pretty interesting thing. The, the single biggest power that we've got right now is that one there, which is the, where it says no, uh, which is the single click install uh, and launch. Like the whole power of the link, that's actually the thing that we should be taking advantage of as much as possible at the moment. Um, because I, I swear that native platforms will start to implement like single click, no launch, or no install, basically, to launch experiences. I just don't know when they're going to do it. Um, so that's the biggest one. So like, the thing I want from all web experiences is these three things. I want us to be in all the expected places. Like, if you're building an application on the web, I want us to be in all the expected places. Maybe a new application or a new site or some content or a blog. They don't need to be everywhere. Um, but if you're building an application, an app-like experience, I want us to be everywhere. I want us to be in the notification tray if you can do notifications in the tab switcher. Uh, so it looks like your experience is a native application in the tab switcher. Uh, I want you to always be available regardless of connectivity, right? You know, app cache has been a pain. Uh, service worker is going to start to change that. But interestingly, I, I, I feel like we need to do a lot of work in that space. And there's very simple things that we can do, even just basic branding. So offer like a page that says, like, Google.com, you need to be online to actually do a search, those types of things. And also, I really want us to push this whole no install required. Like, that's our superpower, that link, and the lack of install is something that we should push. And there's a couple of technologies which are interesting. Like, the physical web is one of those ones, uh, which is kind of interesting because, like, you can't do this without the install step on native applications. But the physical web is basically a BLA beacon that broadcasts the URL, and then you can either have it integrated directly into an application or, your, or into the system itself, and it will discover services around you. And they, the demos that they use is like you're at the cinema, you want to learn more about the late the film, the the the, the, the 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 like the what's it called the poster is broadcasting kind of its its URL. You discover it inside your application or inside the native app inside the native platform and open the browser up. Right, no applications needed at all. I think that's a very powerful thing, and that's coming through physical web. I checked the project out. Right now, you need a native application on Android. Um, but the interesting thing is, if you have Chrome installed on iOS, uh, it installs like a little widget into the notification tray. Um, and that basically says, like, if there's a beacon around you, you can do whatever you want, right? Like, you'll not you do whatever you want. If there's a beacon around you, it'll find the, find the beacon. You click on it, and you go to the experience. And the demo that they're trying to push is kind of payments, right? Like, you're at a, um, a machine where you can kind of, you want to get um, parking credit and parking time. Uh, you don't want to have to install an app for all of these different types of experiences, but you do want to be able to access the website, pay for parking, 
and then just go away and do it. And that's kind of the whole kind of being installed, but being ephemeral at the same time. Like you get a beautiful experience that allows you to interact with the physical world, um, but you don't have any install behind it. And I think that's pretty powerful. I want every single application, if we're building applications to be on the home screen, we can do it. We are like the Chrome team at least and, and Firefox OS is also pushing this idea of installable web applications. And the idea behind this is it's like you have a manifest and the manifest, it, it manifest and service worker and some other criteria. Um, but then it offers this prompt and the prompt is like in this case with Medium. You click the add button and it goes straight to your home screen. That's the place where people launch experiences from. They don't open up a browser anymore to go to a website it seems. So it's interesting. Technically, to do this is very simple. You just have the link rel manifest in your page. You point to a manifest file, and the manifest file describes what to launch, how to launch it, and how it should look on the system. So you have the name, the short name, the URL. You can launch it in full screen, in portrait landscape, great for games and those types of things. Uh, that's an app that I've done called Airhorner. Um, that's basically that type of experience, the instant launch. And it works offline, so it looks and feels like a native application on the system. Uh, we also want deeper integration with, uh, like, uh, with the operating system. So things like theme color, for instance, allow you to control the bar across the top, but also how it looks in the tab switcher as well. Very nice, very simple integration. Lots of sites have already done this. And I think the service worker is probably the most important kind of piece of technology um, since, you know, since the link. And I think it's kind of important for a number of reasons. Um, the service, like, I know we've called the service worker a little bit. Like, the service worker is a spec. It's, I think it's like, kind of hard to read. But service worker is a generic, event-driven, time-limited script context that run on origin. Makes no sense. The way I think about it is a service worker is a background script that sits between the browser and uh, Patrick said the, the network earlier on, but I, I take that one level further between the browser and the operating system. And I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but now, the really interesting thing is that pages have an application style lifecycle. Uh, they have an install step, an activated step, kind of ready to use. Uh, they have an idle state, like doing nothing, and an activated state as well. We've never really had this on the web. And like, we've had it inside pages for page load, but not outside of when the, page, like, when the application is not being used. And I think that's kind of interesting. Now, the simple thing is the page simply registers for a service worker. Uh, and the service worker is a remote file. It's a single script. And then once you register for that service worker, you start off through the process. Uh, you start off with installing. So you can do a lot of things in the install stage. It's not a physical install to the disk, unless you choose it to be. Um, so in one case here, one of the things that you do when you're offline in experiences is you list all the files that you want to kind of offline, like the app cache. Um, but you can do a lot of other different things here. You can store state and kind of other things. You can do database upgrades and a whole bunch of other stuff there. Uh, and then you can, the interesting thing is that this service worker lives past the browser, right? So you close the browser, the service worker is still living in the background. And that's interesting because the system can then provide a whole number of, a whole level of different system events to wake the service worker up to do a bunch of things. And I'm going to be really quickly to go through this. The first is not really to do with kind of being asleep, but the, the, the ability to completely own the network inspect and look at every single request that goes through the system is really, really powerful. And I'm not going to kind of show the demo today um, because I haven't got that much time. But here we are. This is a service worker. The requests come from the browser, go into the service worker script, and you can choose what to do. So in this case, in this kind of demo here, uh, you look at the local cache. If it's locally cached, return that straight to the user. If it's not, go out to the network. Lots of other different patterns for how you want to take experiences offline. This is just one of them. Uh, and Patrick's talk earlier on did a, a good job of explaining different patterns and practices. This is kind of what it looks like. Uh, this is the on-fetch event. This is the thing that fires. Uh, you respond with, essentially, the results from the cache. If it's not in the cache, you, go to, you do a fetch, and you get it from the network and display it. And I'm going to skip over this demo um, because I want to talk about push notifications. Push notifications are the biggest reason why people build native applications, or it's the reason why people say they always build uh, native applications. And a push notification is some action happens on an external server, even if the application or site isn't open. You get a notification, and you can do an action inside that and do, you know, do work inside there. The, ba the basic flow is that your server sends a message to, in our case, uh, GCM. Uh, it then GCM, which is Google Cloud Messaging Service. On Firefox, it's not going to be GCM. But for Chrome, it is Google Cloud Messaging. You send a message to the, the Cloud Messaging Service. That knows how to route the message to the device. The device kind of wakes up and does its native kind of things. It goes, oh, I, I know that there's an, a web application here that needs to be able to handle notifications. So it wakes up Chrome. Chrome then goes, what website needs to kind of wake up and do the, like, do the work? Or which service worker do I need to wake up? Chrome then wakes up the correct service worker, and then you can choose what to do from inside there. So in this case, uh, like the demos aren't kind of tied up, but I'm showing a notification for eBay from a different application. But like you could have like eBay, uh, like you outbid, goes through the system, the browser wakes up, or the service worker wakes up, and then you show the notification. No web page is actually ever displayed in that case. It's kind of interesting. Again, your service worker code is pretty simple. Like you. Um, 
you've actually registered for outside, but then in this case, the, the notification, the push event comes through. Uh, you kind of set up some properties, so you can set the title, the icon, you can even do a vibration pattern and a whole bunch of other stuff. Um, but then you basically say, you know, register a notification and kind of push a notification out, and then that notification will be then displayed in the operating system. It works natively on Android and desktop, which is pretty interesting. But the thing is, and the thing I find about kind of that's pretty cool, uh, and Jake did a screenshot of this, and I, I apologize for this because you're trying to be really funny. Uh, and I don't know whether this swear word actually works over here, but it works in the UK. Um, he sent this push notification to his, to his desktop machine or to his, to his phone. And because Android Wear is actually tied directly to like, your device, any notification that appears on your device, regardless of whether it comes from the web, is actually displayed on the phone as well. You can click it and then kind of open the page up inside the actual browser. It doesn't open up on the watch. It opens up on the browser on the device. And I think that's actually really powerful, right? You're integrated with nat native capabilities just using a simple web API. And how the native kind of platforms are tying together at the moment, they're kind of so like they're sharing state amongst, amongst many different devices. I think that's pretty interesting. Now, there's a lot of different patterns that you can do as well. One of the things I want everyone to do is build offline experiences. If you get a push notification, you don't know that the user's going to action it straight away. So some patterns and kind of practices, you know, if you get a notification, cache the content before you actually do anything with it. Because if the user clicks a notification when they're on the train, and they, can't, they have no internet connection, they get a terrible experience, and then they hit the web because of it. And again, it's very simple code. If you use the cache API that we were using earlier on in the install phase, um, you basically take the cache, you add a URL, and then you add the data to it. And then if the page is then requested later on you know, from the browser, all the data goes through the fetch request. The fetch request looks at the cache, and then pulls the data out, and then renders it back to the user. And you've got a completely offline experience with dynamic data. It's pretty powerful, and it's actually pretty simple. It's, it's a little bit harder than that, but that just illustrates the point. Uh, and then one of the other interesting things is that when you make a notification, you don't want the browser to keep on living while the notification is still in the address bar. So what happens is the service worker, for every single phase, tries to kill itself as quickly as possible. Uh, and one of the things that happens when you raise a notification, you'll create the new notification. The service worker will make the notification, but then die straight away, because it doesn't know when you're going to actually do anything with the, with the notification itself. Um, so you have to have in your service worker the ability to handle the notification clicks. Again, it's, it's pretty simple. You know, the user clicks it, the service worker is invoked, and then Chrome kind of either does whatever you want. In this case, open the page. And it's pretty simple. So you have the notification click event inside the service worker. Um, you have the notification event inside the service worker. You can pull the data out of it, so you can store data inside the notification itself. Uh, and then you can decide what to do with it. So you can either open up a URL or do whatever you want. It's pretty powerful. Now, the interesting thing here is that one of the things that we didn't launch was the ability to do different types of actions on a notification. That's being worked on right now. It's not available just yet, but one of those things is like you, and this is where the, the, the thoughts about the headless web come from, is that basically what happens is that you might have a service, like a, a service worker that raises a notification, and on that notification, there's different actions. So you might have like a Facebook app, right, or web app, and it's got like and comment on. And comment takes you to a web page, but like, all like does, is it just basically in the back end just goes and sets the kind of the state of the note of the of, of the post to be liked, right? You never has to actually open up a web view or a web, a web browser, and that's the choice that you're going to get with the ability to kind of control these actions. You can either decide to basically do some background-based action and kind of send some stuff off to the server based on what the user does, or open the user's web page up or like open up the web page to the user, and it's pretty powerful. And the, the code again is pretty simple on the notification click event. The idea is that the uh, the data object. Um, sorry, the, the notification object will have an action property, which will say uh, what action was actually done, uh, clicked. In this case, it could be like, for instance, and you go and do something with the server with the fetch request, or you'd actually get, then go and open the page if it's a different type of notification. Again, very simple, but very powerful, and it's one of those things that you know, native applications have had for a very, very long time, and we now have access on the web. Um, the, the way I look at Service Worker is it's like a gateway drug. It gets you into more advanced APIs when they choose to come along. Now, the interesting thing is the one called background sync, which was alluded to earlier. You, you can have an event. Basically, one of the things with the, the web is that you fire an event off, and you could be disconnected, right? So yeah, you want to, like, the user wants to do a payment. They click the form, and you, you don't know necessarily whether the form goes, goes through completely. So the background sync event, the idea behind that is you could fire off a web request, and then it basically stores the state until it, you're basically told, in this case, that you're back online. Once you're back online, you can then pass the request through and go and do a bunch of other stuff. But this is one of those really powerful things where you, if you have actions and things that you need to do, and you don't know whether the user is online or offline, the background sync API allows you to send that data through to the user or through to the service 
when the user gets back online. You don't have to do any polling. Like, you could be 10, 20 minutes before you get back online. The browser and the operating system know when you have the ability to do the connection. It will tell you, you'll go and do the thing that you need to do. Uh, and then one of the things here as well, we talked about it a little bit earlier, was the periodic background sync. So every morning at 7 a.m. in theory, you could basically say, go and fetch me the latest news. The web browser never has to open up, up at all. The, 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 the service worker behind the scenes will be activated. You go off and download all the assets and those things that you need, put them into the cache so when the user kind of clicks a notification to go into something, then they can, they get there and the actual data is there available waiting for them instantly. So I think it's pretty powerful. And then there's all the like, things where they're trying to work out whether you, know, you want to get notified by beacons. So the physical web API, like if you're near a beacon, does your service worker want to get notified of, of the fact that you're near a beacon and then do something with that? It's completely unspec at the moment, but that's where we're kind of thinking about going to some extent. Things like geofences as well. If you set a geofence up, like on enter, on leave, those types of things are pretty interesting. So the interesting thing here is it does all the stuff in the background. Um, I've got two minutes left, I've got lots of slides to go, but I'm doing all right, it's not too bad. So it does everything in the background, that's the whole point of the service worker. Your application doesn't need to be alive and in, like, in the user's attention space. It can just be off waiting for system events to fire, and I think that's really, really powerful. I want us to also think about building richer platforms, and now I'm going to go through some APIs, but these APIs, like, I don't want to go into an API kind of dive, I've got the code in there for a future reference. But you know, we can use things like the camera and get access to everything, that's pretty cool. You can build offline experiences that work. Uh, with the microphone, so you can kind of capture data, save it, and process it, and do some really nice stuff. You know, we have access to battery, right? Like, I can't imagine that many people using this type of thing, but we have access to this underlying data. Next to no one is using these things. Uh, we have the ability to understand whether permissions have already been previously granted, so we can actually put responsive user interfaces in front of people. Again, it's pretty powerful, very new. And then you can understand whether the user is actually connected or what type of network that they're on. You don't understand whether it's 2G, but you'll know whether it's cellular or Wi-Fi. Now, the interesting thing here is that what I'm trying to get to is like we have a lot of new features come into the web platform, um, but it's a relatively slow cadence, and we don't actually add all these features in. But my worry is that the, the web can't match native, like, can't match the cadence of native applications. Everyone thinks native platforms only update once a year when either Marshmallow or iOS, like iOS, iOS comes out. Like Android updates every six to eight weeks, like under its kind of under its uh, other kind of play services system, and I don't think we can ever match that cadence. Um, now, the interesting thing is in consumer applications, and I've done some data on this, and I'm going to run over by a minute or two, sorry, uh, is that every single, um, that there was some data that was kind of uh, checked out, but like every single step that you make a user go through before they actually complete the task, you lose 20% of the users. Now, I, I charted this out in comparison to the web and native. Native applications, you have to get the install, you have to drive them to the page, they do the install, do the download, before they even click open to open the experience. And on the web, we have this amazing ability to bypass all of that stuff, and I think this is an amazing experience. Um, we have, to, we have to really watch out for, the, for native applications because they are solving these problems. They're trying to make it as friction-free as possible to install native applications. But this today is our killer feature, right? We don't have any of all those steps, and we can convert and engage users really seamlessly now with Service Worker, and even just without any of those new APIs. But I want us to be, like, the biggest thing, and I think Patrick's talk was actually probably, was actually it was amazing about this, is that we need to be instant. We need to be there instantly when the user either clicks a link uh, or kind of clicks a notification or any other kind of part of stuff. And the critical render path is probably the biggest thing that you can start to kind of focus for. Uh, we need to kind of get progressive rendering onto everyone's radar. Render within a second, that's the goal. Not every the entire site, but part of the site on the page. Uh, just to let the user know that there is, there, there is a thing that they can start to interact with. Now, the thing that you're going to have to understand is that the critical render path is something that you actually need to understand. And I don't know whether everyone does, but fundamentally, CSS and JavaScript block the first render. So you need to do as much as possible to get your CSS and JavaScript out of the way um, before you can actually display anything on the page. And once you do that, you start to get really, really quick experiences. And aggressively off offline and cache content, like service worker and a bunch of other technologies, give you the ability to make sure that you're either proactive or responsive to engage, like user engagements, to make sure content is available. Like there's literally no one in this audience who's actually doing anything offline at the moment. We need to really seriously think about making our experiences work offline, not just for the case of when we have no connection, but to be instant and available for the users straight away. So I think like, we can optimize a lot of other things, and I, this is a, uh, a relatively useless slide, but my thought is like, and this is to Vitaly's uh, uh, point earlier on, there's a lot of things you can do to optimize the experience once you're inside the browser and once you're inside the page, and concentrate on that, because like, we, we're already winning in terms of kind of the link and the instant open. Instant open. Um, but like the user experience and performance, we need to really optimize those things to keep people engaged with experiences. 
Now, one thing I do want to say is to prepare for the headless web, and I'm sorry I'm not talking about headless web too much, is like what the reason why I'm talking about this is like the, the web is moving outside the browser. It's moving into native applications inside web views and Chrome custom tabs and a whole bunch of other stuff. But it's also getting to the point where you don't actually ever have to interact with the web page to be able to interact with the web experience and also not to have a native application installed. So things like notifications, like notifications, like you never actually, in theory, have to see a browser. Once, once you register for the system, you never have to see a browser again to be able to interact with your web-based experience that was never installed by the user, but was instantly kind of made available to the system, which is really powerful. Things like physical web, again, no installs, instant access to applications and data to be able to interact with physical content. And then also the Chrome team are doing a whole bunch of other things to try and make sure that if something happens on your device inside, say, YouTube, for instance, you can control it from other different aspects of connected devices around you as well. So this is a case of the play, the play button, for instance. Uh, you can control the volume, you can control pause and play and those types of things. Like we as de browser developers need to do a lot bigger job, like a lot better job of actually making things available for you as developers seamlessly without any integration. So can I wrap up? Sorry. <laughs> uh, performance, engagement, offline access and capabilities, these are all things that we fundamentally need to work on. And like performance is probably the biggest one and you can go home today and actually do a whole bunch of things to make your sites work a lot more effectively. Offline access is going to take a little bit longer, um, but you should actively look at these types of things. I want to get away from this mentality. I need to go back to India and do a whole bunch of other stuff. I don't think I'm going to have any impact. Um, but we need to get rid of the idea that the web is not suitable for kind of native-like experiences. And we want users, like the, maybe the bridging gap is make a engaged user on the web, give them as much as they need until they need to go and install an app. I think everyone in this room wants to have an engaged experience and keep them on the web without actually having to do anything. Uh, to wrap up, uh, we have some guidance. Web Fundamentals is the biggest one that we've got. Uh, updates as well if you want to stay on top of the latest news. ChromeStatus.com if you want to learn about new APIs that are coming through and where we're going. And also to talk to the rest of the, like, the broader Chrome DevRel team. We've got a Slack channel as well. I'm really sorry for going over. Uh, I'd like to thank you all for your time, and I'll share these slides later on. Thank you, Paul.